what is prayer? Prayer isn't listening for God to say something audible to you that you can hear with your ears or suddenly understand with your mind. Prayer is talking with God. Prayer is communion with the triune God. We speak to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Prayer is a reflection of our current relationship with God in any given moment. Talk with God. Tell Him how much you love Him and how much you need His help. He is waiting and wanting to listen to you. And through Jesus, He will shower you with the grace and the mercy that you need when you need it. Well, good morning. It is great to see you. Some of you look a little more sweaty than normal, but I'm thankful uh, that we're all here together. And I would invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 15. Someone told me on the way in that we could have made a lot of money by having fans for sale. And I will make a deal with you if you listen really, really good. I might shave off a few minutes of the sermon. But if you don't listen good, I've been to an old-fashioned revival once or twice in my life. I got a handkerchief up here that I can go for a long time. Romans chapter 15. We are parachuting in to the book of Romans to read a prayer that Paul has prayed for believers and that the Bible instructs us to pray for one another. So let's read Romans 15, verses 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ <clears throat> did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, we are here, and it is my prayer that because of this time that we spend, these next few minutes, that we would be more united, that we would be more on mission, that we would see the power of the gospel to bring together the most unlikely people for the greatest cause in the whole world. And I pray that you would spur us on as a church to pray this prayer and that we would see all of Jacksonville come to know all of Jesus for all of life because of it. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So Jenny and I, uh, we've been married uh, for a little over 12 years now. And uh, several of you know that we met in high school, but we actually never dated in high school. But we were in a context where we got to know one another uh, and uh, spend a good bit of time with each other. And one of those times was our senior trip that our class took. And we're both from Tennessee, and the senior trip class, the big thing to go to was Disney World. So we got on a plane, a bunch of seniors, and we came down to Disney World, which is hotter than it is in here, actually. And people stand in line for hours, sweating, while they shove an ice cream bar that's $500 into their mouth <laughs> and then ride a 30-second ride and then do it all day long. So you're doing good. You're doing real good. But that's what we did. And specifically, we went to Epcot. Now, Epcot, it's a great place. You can walk around the, the World Showcase and eat and have a great time. But the thing I remember about Epcot was the grand finale, the fireworks display, and it was incredible, and I had never seen anything quite like it. And I was there, and I realized the whole theme of Epcot was unity. That's the whole thing. That's what they're all about. I learned that uh, in, uh, in the opening, the grand opening of Epcot, they, uh, they had this the fountain of the nations, and they had 29 countries represented with dignitaries dressed in all this regalia with a pitcher or a vessel of water, and at the right moment they would pour water into this fountain, and that water was taken from one of the great waters of their country that they flew over into uh, to have this water pouring ceremony so that the waters could come together and be united. And that uh, people are crying, and people are really moved, and the fireworks are going off, and it was amazing, but I realized it was quite empty. It was empty. It was a call to unity, but the call to unity wasn't grounded in anything. Uh, we were to be united together for unity's sake. We were to respect one another for the sake of respect. We were to be in harmony just to be in harmony. And all these people paid a ton of money to come and feel really good about this moment. And there is an appeal to what Epcot has going on. There's an appeal to this call to unity. And I want to submit to you that the call to unity is greater, stronger, and more superior that we just read in Romans 15. And that the call to unity is actually a call here in the text full of real substance, a real grounding in something great, a real tangible unity that you and I are called to that is much bigger than a magical dream, but rather is a gospel dream. Unity is God's concept. He has the exclusive rights over it, and he calls us to it to be united in a powerful way. So look at the text. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. The first observation I want to make here is the love of Christ unites unexpected people. Have you thought about how unusual church is. It's an unusual place. I'm looking at people with all different kinds of backgrounds, all different kinds of economic levels, 
all different kinds of ethnicities. There's lawyers and bankers, cashiers, truck drivers. There's a whole lot of random people here this Sunday morning. And some of you are awkward, right? Have you ever met anyone awkward at church? I have. Some of you are really smooth. Some of you really can carry on a conversation with no problems. It's like slicing butter. But we gather here not because we're great people, not because we're smooth, not because we have it figured out. We're gathered here because there's some among us who are strong and some who are weak and some who are outcasts and some who are rejected by the world. But we're here because of the love of Christ. The text says, look at verse 7, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. God did not save you based upon anything related to you, your circumstances, or your upbringing. He welcomed you freely. He welcomed you fully. He welcomed you with warmth and kindness and love. You may be the hunchback of Notre Dame, but God loves you. You may be the most popular person that's ever been at your school, but God loves you. God has welcomed us, and he has done that at great cost to himself. And we can be united not on the basis of who we are, but on the basis of who he is. This is amazing. I mentioned Jenny in high school. Jenny and I were friends, and I thought Jenny was the nicest person I had ever met. I still think that. And Jenny was so nice that it actually became a problem because all the guys in our class thought she liked them because she was so kind and nice and respectful to them. But they all had to figure out, no, Jenny just loves everybody. Except for me. I, I figured it out that <laughs> she liked me. But when you met Jenny, you met someone who would listen to you talk for however long. You met someone who would not just tune you out, but actually ask thoughtful questions. You met someone who would follow up and say, hey, I actually am praying for you this week. I know that your dad is, uh, is not feeling well and is having a procedure. She would be a true friend. God takes the initiative to reconcile us to himself and be our true friend. And then he says here, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And then we are to be those people who do the same that Jesus did to us. So let me ask you a couple of questions for reflection and prayer. Are you welcoming to the people in this room. When was the last time that you spoke to someone here at the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Florida that you did not know? When was the last time that you went out of your way to go up to someone and say, hey, I've seen you around or, hey, I don't know if we've ever met before. How long have you been coming to First Baptist? When was the last time that you did not avoid an awkward conversation at church, but instead you embraced it? You were made uncomfortable because Christ was made uncomfortable to welcome you. Our church 
will flourish when we, you and I, welcome one another with the same love of Christ that we have received. The next observation here is it's Christ's gospel that creates unity. Christ's gospel that creates unity. It's not just his love in general, but it's a particular example of love. Look at the text. Look at verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. This is a quote from Psalm 69. It's referring to the death of Jesus. The reproaches that people were mocking Christ, they came upon him and he bore them. The gospel creates a unity at the great expense of Jesus. Have you thought about this? The pain that Jesus experienced, that pain produced us here. Jesus didn't have to bear the reproaches. He had a legion of angels that he could call and stop them. Jesus didn't have to experience the mocking and the suffering and the hardship, but he did it so everyone here could gather. Unity requires pain. It requires the pain of the gospel that unites us. And I hate to tell you, but Jesus calls us to be little Christs, which means if we are going to be united, it will require pain. You, it will require you and me to experience pain. Look at the text. Look at verse 1. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Paul is saying, if you want unity, it will cost you because it cost Jesus. Jesus had the mind of love that came and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so what that means is your preferences are going to have to die. If you're strong here, if you're spiritually mature, Paul is calling you to not please yourself, but instead to value the weaker person here. And then if you're weak, he's calling you. He says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, not our good, his good, to build him up. I gave a positive example of Jenny. Let me give you a negative example of how not to build one another up from Sean. So recently, I was hanging out with a group of you. We were having a good time. And there was this moment in the, uh, in the hangout where... Uh, it was just the right opportunity that was just waiting for a sarcastic remark that could be humorous. Has anyone ever experienced that right opportunity? And it was just holding itself out there. And I took it. And I made a humorous but sarcastic remark against someone in the room. And everyone laughed. And I laughed. And then, after it was all over, I got in the car. And I'm listening to the audible book, Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges. And he was quoting Ephesians 4, 29, 
Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only what is necessary for building one another up, a word that fits the occasion and imparts grace to the hearer. And I was convicted. And I was like, oh Lord, I shouldn't have said what I said. I was being funny to build myself up, not to build up my brother in Christ. So I called my brother in Christ, and he was not offended. It's the glory of a king to overlook an offense. He was not offended, and he forgave me. But I know I'm not alone. When we want to build others up, something that we want must die. Jesus calls us to follow his example and pick up a cross and die and follow after him. If you think unity is just going to happen, that's not true. Unity is hard work. So let me ask you a question for reflection. What in you needs to die? What preference What's your preference that needs to go away so that you can be more united with your brothers and sisters here? Is it your preference about something in Sunday school? Is it your preference about something in the service? Is it a preference about someone else here? What is it? What's your preference in your marriage that needs to go away? What's your preference in your parenting that needs to be crucified? Look to Jesus, who gladly bore our sins on his back so that we can freely give up our preferences and bear one another's burdens here. Read with me the next two verses, and I'll give you another observation from this text. Verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. This is a great text. Because what it does is it points us to the scriptures. So he quotes Psalm 69, which I did not know until studying this. Psalm 69 is quoted nine times in the New Testament. Nine times referring to the messianic fulfillment of Jesus. And Paul is is one of those quotations here. And it says, whatever was written in the Old Testament in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. God is honest that sometimes unity requires endurance. That's what he says. Through the endurance and encouragement of the scriptures. And if you are here, and maybe you're honest, I don't don't know what's going on in your life, but maybe you're intention with someone here in the church. Maybe you're struggling to be eager to maintain a spirit of unity in the bond of peace. I want you to know that Christ's word sustains unity. And you can hear this word, be instructed, be encouraged, and then be called to endure. Don't give up on the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. Be eager to maintain it. Endure, endure in order that all of Jacksonville might know that Jesus Christ is Lord. The stunning thing for me about this prayer is actually how hopeless we are on our own to accomplish it. Look at verse 5. 
may the God of endurance. Okay, so he connects the scriptures that call us to endure with the God who endures. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. Grant you. Grant you. Meaning, you and I cannot be united without asking God to unify us. I don't know if this is going to blow your mind like it blew my mind this week. You and I must pray this prayer. We can't be unified here at First Baptist on our own. We must pray. May God grant it to us. Meaning, if he doesn't grant it to us, it won't happen. Do you see that? Do you feel the desperation that that is? Are you desperate to be united? We must pray. We must ask God for his help. It is not going to happen with four easy steps. There's no tips and tricks that I can give you. We must ask God to bind us together by his gospel, through his spirit, around his word. I, I suspect maybe there are folks here, you have viewed unity as an added bonus. It's, it's like dessert. If it happens, it's really great. But if it doesn't happen, that's really okay. And that's not what this text is saying. This text connects unity to the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's not an add-on. Unity is not just an extra dessert at the end of the day. Now, some of you, some of you might say, I didn't know you, that dessert was optional. <laughs> I thought dessert was required with all meals. That's not what I'm talking about. This illustration falls flat if that's you. It works if you don't eat dessert at every meal. Unity is not optional. We must be desperate, desperate to say, God, we need you to bring harmony and peace in our church and in our lives so that your gospel might be lifted high. And that brings us to the last observation. Look at verse five and six. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together with one voice, Glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Christ's mission requires unity. Christ's mission demands, requires unity. I mentioned uh, Epcot and Epcot, that fountain where they all poured the water from all the different nations into it. I was watching this documentary uh, that one of you recommended, and they're showing all the people pour these vessels of water into this fountain, and then the fountain shoots up. And the guy, one of the VPs at Disney, he's there and he's talking about the 29 nations, and he chokes up and he starts to cry. And he said, we reach the world. And I'm watching that, and I'm thinking, well, there was only 29 nations, so it's not the world. But then the fountain closed down in 2019. Literally, it's not working anymore. But Disney is saving the water, saving the water for some future park uh, exhibit. And I say that to say, we 
have such a more beautiful, wonderful, substantial mission and unity that will attract the lost when we are truly united, not just for the sake of unity, but for the sake of the glory of God. The, the latest Epcot song is called The Symphony of Us. That's the opposite of what it says here. It says, together with one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. We are not here to celebrate us and our unity. We are united to celebrate Christ and what he has done. When you read Revelation, Revelation 5, the the picture you get are myriads and myriads, thousands and thousands of people surrounding the throne, and they are united. Literally, every tribe, nation, and tongue is there. All of them. Not one of them is neglected. And they're there. And they're there, and they're praising themselves? No. They're not praising themselves. They're not singing about themselves. They're saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And by his blood, he ransomed people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. You and I, we are united when we come to care about the glory of God. When we come not for our own selves, but because Jesus Christ was crucified and we're willing to lay down our lives for others. So let me ask you, when was the last time you were excited about God's glory? When was the last time you got thrilled, you were happy, your heart soared, not for your glory, not for how you look on Sunday, but because Jesus Christ is lifted high and he's drawing all people to himself. John chapter 17, the prayer that Jesus prays is, Father, that they might be perfectly one so that the world might know that you have sent me and I am one with you. When First Baptist is united, that is when we will be able to reach all of Jacksonville, all of the world, with all of Jesus for all of life. One final question, maybe the most important question. When was the last time you prayed for unity in our church? Let's pray now and ask God to help us with this task. God, you are the God of all endurance and encouragement. And I ask that you would grant to us, to First Baptist, to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice, we might glorify you and exalt your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.